This is a very short sutta. I think it's only front and back, <laughs> isn't it? Very short, short discourse. So this is from, as you can see, A N 8.6. A N 8.6. A N is Anguttara Nikaya. That means gradual saying. So you've got Book of One, Book of Two, Book of Three, I think up to what? Book of Twelve, uh, I think is it. So you have, oh, this is Book of Eight. So that means there are eight things in this discourse. <laughs> okay, there are eight things in this discourse. And Sutta num uh, number six. Right? So it's called Loka Vipati Sutta. It's called Failings of the World. Okay? All right, let's, let's, let's see. Let's see what I have got what I've got here. Okay. Okay, let's let's look at the discord. Bhikkhu. So this also addressed to monks, right? But but again, you know, even though they address to monks, it affects lay people too. Okay. So bhikkhus or monks, these eight worldly conditions revolve around the world. And the world revolves around these eight worldly conditions. And what are these eight? So they are generally regarded as gain and loss, disrepute and fame. You have your, your notes, right? Uh, and fame, blame and praise, and pleasure and pain. So these eight worldly conditions revolve around the world. And the world revolves around these eight worldly conditions. So let's see these eight. Alright? So gain and loss, fame and ill fame, praise and blame, happiness and sorrow. They're called the four paths. Sometimes in Chinese Buddhism, they're called the eight winds. Eight winds. Winds, you know, wind? The, the wind. Because we are swept by these eight winds. Everywhere you, you, you go, you cannot escape from these eight winds. Whether you like it or you don't <laughs> like it. All right? Okay, later we will go about that. Huh? So, there are two translations. Tanisaro uses gain and loss. Bodhi uses gain and loss. Tanisaro uses status and disgrace, fame and disrepute, censure and praise, and blame and praise, pleasure and pain, and pleasure and pain. Okay, just give you two, two different translations of that. Okay, let's look at the second paragraph. Because an uninstructed whirling meets gain and loss, disrepute and fame, blame and praise, and pleasure and pain. So, remember, first line is uninstructed whirling. Okay? Second sentence is, an instructed noble disciple also meets gain and loss, disrepute and fame, blame and praise, and pleasure and pain. What is the distinction, the disparity, the difference between an instructed noble disciple and an uninstructed whirling with regard to this? Okay, you know the meaning of this second paragraph? Who is an uninstructed whirling? Uh, the people like you and me now, <laughs> so we are considered the uninstructed whirling. Here, whirling, you know, this is a ra rather unusual word. Whirling, as if we are talking about some aliens from uh, other planets, then we are the <laughs> people from this world. <laughs> so we are considered as uninstructed, okay? Or you can say the unenlightened being, unenlightened person. So we meet gain and loss, right? We meet rest. Uh, disrepute and fame, praise and blame. And then the, the next sentence says, an instructed noble disciple. Who is an instructed noble disciple? Say an, an enlightened being, someone who is enlightened. Okay? So he's instructed noble disciple, Arya, right? the Pali word they use, Arya. Also meets with gain and loss. So what's the difference? You and I, we also meet these eight worldly conditions. And then the, um, the, 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 the enlightened being, they also meet this eight worldly conditions. So what is the difference? <laughs> so next, third paragraph. Huh? Bhante, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One. Take recourse in the Blessed One. It would be good if the Blessed One would clear up the meaning of this statement. So even the monks at the time, they were so not, not, not very sure what the Buddha meant when he said the uninstructed whirling and then the instructed whirling. And who is and Bante means what? Ban, Bante is uh, as for those who are new is, is a on, is like a, 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 a respect that you you gave to you know like a, a teacher right? Teacher Bante. Uh, I think the Pali is Ayasma. Ayasma, Ayasma. That's why <laughs> Bante Agachita is called Ayasma. <laughs> Bante Agachita Ayasma. But you can still call him Bante. Doesn't matter. 
Uh, in case you don't know how to pronounce, you call him, call him something else. Uh. <laughs> you, you call him ayam something. <laughs> you call him ayam. Uh, ayam. Uh. So ayasma. Ayasma is uh, it, it means uh, bante uh, in that, in that. And then the Thai they call achan, isn't it? Achan, achan like teacher. You know. And the Burmese were what Sayadaw, right? Um, what else? Then the Chinese what? Sifu, right? Teacher, master, uh, venerable, uh, venerable. Huh? Okay. So Bante, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One. We take recourse in the Blessed One. So please tell us. Can you tell us the meaning of what, of what you're saying here? Then what did the Buddha say? Then listen, bhikkhus, and attend closely. So he said, please listen and listen closely. I will speak. Yes, Bhante, those bhikkhus replied. The Blessed One said this, bhikkhus, that means monks, right? Monks, bhikkhus means monks, okay? When an uninstructed whirling meets with gain, he does not reflect, oh, this gain that I've met is impermanent, is suffering, is subject to change. He does not understand it as it really is. Remember just now I, I told you what is the purpose of Vipassana? Is to see things as it really is. Eh? So you see this word here, as it really is. Okay. So when you see things, you see impermanence, you see dukkha. <coughs> and then when he meets with loss, likewise he meets with fame, he meets with disrepute, he meets with blame, he meets with praise, pleasure, pain. He also does not reflect us. This pain that I've met is impermanent, is suffering, is subject to change. He does not understand it as it really is. <clears throat> then the Buddha continues, gain obsesses his mind. If you, you gain something, you get obsessed with it. But you lose something, you also obsessed with it. Right? Not? Right? Fame, if you have fame, if suddenly you become very famous, it also obsesses obsess your mind. Right? And then if disrepute also obsesses your mind. You know, recently someone told, told me, like in the news, newspapers now, the latest, what, the, like the Korean pop group, you know, the, the, the young, 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 young pop group in, in Korea making sensation, K-pop, uh, the K-pop, uh, BTS. BTS, BTS, you know, they perform in America, they perform in, you know, every day, even going to Saudi Arabia to, to perform. So a lot of fame, you know, at that young age. You know, and we have we have seen you know other other examples now. How how long can those fame last? You know, right? During my time, people like you know, there's this name called Elvis Presley. Maybe some of you are too young to know who Elvis Presley is. Right? <laughs> so he, he was uh, really famous. You know, everybody talks about Elvis Presley. You know, but the, by the 70s, when he was already in his 40s, you know, he was getting fat and bloated, and and his performance was no longer popular. And eventually, he died. Die of drug overdose, <laughs> you know, die of frustration and all these things. So how much fame, you know? Sometimes people get obsessed by, by, by this. And you see this a lot in celebrities, isn't it? Mm, celebrities, right? So blame obsesses his mind. Praise obsesses. So pleasure obsesses his mind. So you have pleasure, you know, sometimes people just doesn't know how, 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 how to stop having pleasure, right? And then pain also obsesses his mind. He's attracted to gain. Uh, then the next part, he's attracted to gain but repelled by loss. He only wants gain, he doesn't want loss. But can it happen? Can you only have gain, you cannot have, have loss. It cannot happen, right? Right? It just cannot happen. <laughs> okay? He's attracted to pleasure and repelled by pain. Right? He does involve with attraction and repulsion, he's not freed from birth, from old age and death, from sorrow, lamentation, pain, dejection and anguish. So he's not freed from suffering. Okay? But bhikkhus, but monks, when an instructed noble disciple meets with gain, he reflects, oh, the gain that I have met is impermanent, is suffering and is subject to change. He therefore understands it as it really is. Likewise, when he meets loss, he can accept it. When he meets fame, when he becomes very famous, <laughs> when, he, when people start inviting him to write books, to give talks, give TED talks, you know, you know TED talks, <laughs> TED, TED, you know. Uh, when, you, when you're invited to give TED talks, you become very famous, right? <laughs> right? So, you know, you know, there's quite a number of monks invited to give TED talks, you know. 
You know that? Mm. Uh, and then this repute, blame, praise. How does he reflect? Oh, this pain that I have met is impermanent. It's suffering and subject to change. So he understands it as it really is. So that's the difference. Okay? And then the, the one more paragraph. Gain does not obsess his mind. And loss also does not obsess his mind. This is about the instructed uh, noble disciple. Huh? Fame does not obsess his mind. And disrepute does not obsess his mind. Blame also does not obsess his mind. And praise also does not obsess his mind. Pleasure does not obsess his mind. And pain does not obsess his mind. So he is not attracted to gain or repelled by loss. He is not attracted to fame or repelled by dis disrepute. He is not attracted to praise or repelled by blame. He is not attracted to pleasure or repelled by pain. Having thus discarded attraction and repulsion, he is freed from birth, from old age and death, from sorrow, lamentation, pain, dejection, and anguish. So he is freed from suffering. This because is the distinction, the disparity, the difference between an instructed noble disciple and an uninstructed worthy. So it's a very short discourse. But what is the key word here? What is it that, what is the quality that this, this instructed noble disciple has that the uninstructed whirling does not have? Uh, equanimity. Uh, that's the key word. Not mentioned, but that's, that's the key word. Okay? So equanimity is not indifference. Some people say you read this, oh, like that, let it become like a robot, like that, no feeling, really. <laughs> isn't it? Like no, 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 no feeling. But that's not the case. Okay, I'll give, show you some slides just to, to explain why, why equanimity is not indifference, right? So the key words here is an ordinary person, which is Putujana, and well instructed disciple, Arya Savaka. You know this word, Arya? No, noble. Savaka is the Disciple, follower, savaka, from the word savakas, from swara, hearing, hearing. So it's called a hearer. You see, those who become arahats, those who listen to the teachings of the Buddha, became enlightened. They are called savakas. Savakas is translated as hearers, hear. That means they hear the teachings of the Buddha, they put it into practice, and then they become en enlightened. So they are called savakas. Right, so when you hear the word savaka, so sometimes Theravada is called savaka yana. <laughs> In the to, to, to the Mahayana tradition, they, they use the word savaka yana. Right, then you got savaka yana, bodhisattva yana, pachika yana, pachika buddha yana. So the silent buddha and then the bodhisattva. So savaka means a, 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 well, li literal translations la. <laughs> literal translation. Exactly. Yeah. That's why sometimes you, you, like the first five monks that the Buddha talked to, after li listening, they all become enlightened. So we wonder ourselves, why are we all try to <laughs> read so much, try to read so many suttas, attend this, this monk's meditation, retreat, after retreat, meditation, still cannot enlighten. <laughs> uh, maybe we get, get more confused after that. <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah, during Buddha's time, they're very easy. Huh? Listen only, poop, they get enlightened. Huh? And that's because they have already created so much, we, we, we said, paramis, you know, the, the perfections, the merits in the past. Right? So some people actually, uh, they, they have this aspiration that, that they know it's very di difficult to become enlightened. They say, whenever I'm reborn, I want to, to, to always get the opportunity to listen to the Dhamma, to practice the Dhamma, so that next many, many world cycles when Metiya Buddha is, is here, the next Buddha is here. Then I'll be reborn under Metiya Buddha. Then I sit under the foot of the, 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 the feet of Metiya Buddha, and then maybe I'll be an, an enlightened. Uh, but Metiya may come and go. You're still not enlightened. <laughs> because even during the Buddha's time, many people, after listening to his teachings, they just walk, walk away, right? Remember the <laughs> right? Uh, the the first one was that the Dona. There's a sutta called Dona Sutta. There was this, this person, Dona, so he was walking, after the Buddha, after Prince Siddhartha became enlightened, he was walking and then Buddha was walking towards him. Then he looked at, look at the Buddha and said, oh, you, are, you, see, you look at his, his countenance, his, his, his uh, personality, was so, you know, was so attractive. And he said, oh, he asked, are you, um, you, know, you look so different, you look, you look so, so majestic, so magnificent. He said, are you a god? Buddha said, no, I'm not a god. Oh, you're not a god. 
then are you uh, some special angel, some special divine being? No, I'm not a special divine being. Then what are you? Are you a devil <laughs> in, 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 a, in, a, in a human or in God's clothing? He said, no, I'm not a devil either. Then are you a human being? He said, no, I'm not a human being. He must be one thing. He said, what, what on earth are you? He said, well, I'm the Buddha. I'm the enlightened one. Then Dona said, oh, so be it. And then Dona just, just, just walk off. <laughs> Dona, I'm thinking this guy is a, he's a, he's a, he's a wacko. Like. <laughs> just, just let him be, you know. So there's a sutta called Dona Sutta, D O N A. D O N A. Right? So you can read that sutta about how, how even some people, you know, even meeting face to face with the Buddha. Right? So someone said, maybe if, even if today is Metiya Buddha is here, you, cannot, you may not be able to recognize Metiya Buddha. <laughs> right? Okay. So this is what the. The, the, the sutta is a very short sutta, right? So, in an ordinary person, there arise gain and loss, status and disgrace, censure and praise, pleasure and pain. In a well instructed disciple, they also arise this same. So, what's the difference between them? Okay? So, he says, when it arises, he does not reflect. The ordinary person, he does not reflect. Gain has arisen. It is inconstant, stressful, and subject to change. He does not discern it. You know the meaning of discern, like he does not have the wisdom to, 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 to determine, right? So there are three words here inconstant, which is anicca, dukkha, and viparinama, subject to change. Now, where do you, okay, you know this word anicca, it means impermanent, right? Anicca means impermanent. We always say everything is Im impermanent, right? Anicca, right? The other is dukkha, I think you know. Duk, from the word duk means difficult to bear. Right? Difficult to bear, suffering sometimes. Vipari Nama, subject to change. Everything subject to change. Right? So in the first noble in the first discourse, Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, you see this word also. Right? So, Wait, is it not anatta? Ah, in this said, well, it didn't talk about anatta. It's not mentioned. Right? It's not mentioned. Okay? <coughs> it's not mentioned. So the so the so the, so loss arises, status arises, disgrace arises, everything arises, pain arises. He does not reflect. Pain arises. He is inconstant. Okay. So the ordinary person. So his mind remains consumed with the gain. His mind remains consumed with the loss, with the status, with the grace. So the mind get con get get attached to it. In fact, it is said that when gain arises, he gets attracted to it. When loss arises, he gets repelled by by it. He just wants it to to be away as as soon as possible. But is it possible, right? So an ordinary person, he only welcomes the recent gain and he rebels against the recent loss. He welcomes the status and rebels against the disgrace. He welcomes the praise, he rebels against the censure. And he, we don't like to be blamed, right? We like to be praised, right? He welcomes pleasure, happiness, and he rebels against pain. So that's what an ordinary person does. Uh, as he is engaged in welcoming and rebelling, you know, one pair he welcomes, the other pair he rebels. Remember? There are, four, there, are, there are four pairs, right? So there's one he welcomes the gain, the praise, the blame, uh, the, the praise, the gain, you know, the, the status, all this he welcomes. But when the rest, when the other part comes, he rebels against, right? So he's not released from birth, aging, or death, from sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, or despair. So he's not released from suffering and distress. If you are, if you are always welcoming only the, the good side of things and trying to push away the negative side of things, you will never be happy. Because they are like two sides of a coin. Right? Two sides of, of a coin. So there are three things here. is birth, old age, and death. These are the three things you cannot run away from. Yeah, right? but, 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 Yeah, that's that, that's where the, the, the problem is. He said the only thing that doesn't change is change. <laughs> Correct. We we always change. We we always change. In other words, we try to to adapt to different environment, to to different situation. Right. We we have to change because if we don't change, we end up like the dinosaurs also. So what the Buddha is saying is also true even in the in the mundane world itself, isn't it? Right? So it is true in terms of our spiritual practice. Right? Okay? It's, it's also true. Because change in others, we accept that there is change. We, when, you don't, when you accept change, then you will not cling to it. The whole, whole, whole idea is that when you can accept that things will always change, then you do not cling to it. But you cannot accept change, you always want to cling to it. Yeah, but I don't know, because you know the aging 
you know, everybody wait for all these big cars and everything that just look beautiful. You know? Even though they're going older, older, older. Yeah, and that's... They're bringing on, you know, so but we're changing. We also keep changing. It's the same. Yeah, but but yeah, but at least it helps to boost up the Korean the, the Korean economy. Eh? Yeah. Otherwise, the Korean economy will be in trouble. Eh? So that's a good, good one. Eh? Then a woman will not go to Korea. Yeah. You see, that's, that's the thing is because we are always chasing. We are always chasing for to 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 remain to to remain young as yeah and yeah. You know, and for example, aging. You know, like, uh, you know, I, as you know, I travel a lot. So when you travel, they give you those, those travel kit. When you take up, they got those moisturizer. And the, 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 the most recent, I was on Qatar Airways. They came over and they said, it's an anti-aging moisturizing cream. <laughs> <laughs> so, as, you know, I, I don't think, we, you know, by putting that, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to grow younger. But, but that's, that's the way hu human, you know, uh, hu humanity wants to move, move towards. But... But that's why it's called an uninstructed whirling. You see? Uninstructed. So it will not, you can chase, but it will not happen. All right? Eventually, people will, 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 will just die. So that's why you have old age, birth, old age, and death. Okay? So then the key words then, you've got this word sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair. So all, all these are the, the part you can skip that. Now, so the, the final one, well instructed person, gain arises for a well instructor. So he. He reflects, yeah, gain has arisen in me, but this gain that I experience, it will not stay with me forever. But it doesn't mean that you don't appreciate it. You can enjoy it. But you're not attached to it. You're not cling to it. That's what he's saying. Because if you cling to it, how, how long can it last? Isn't it? Right, no. For example, you know, many people at my age, you know, they've got children, you know, many of them are living home, they will go overseas to study. So, on one hand, it's a gain that, you know, they are going to sleep. But if you cling to it, you say, oh, you know, I must not let, let them go. Then, of course, there's a lot, to be, a lot of suffering, isn't it? Right? So, somehow, at some stage, we have, to, we have to, to let go. That is adapting to the change. You see? But if we cannot accept that, then, you're gonna, then you are in trouble. Some people cannot just let go. You, you must learn to, to, to let go. That's the whole Buddhist premise, you know. All right? There's nothing wrong with change. Please remember that there's nothing wrong with change. Because change is amoral. Change is just the nature of existence. But it's because of our attachment to, to the change that we want things to remain the same as it always is. Can it always be the same? It cannot. Isn't it? If you look, if you look at your, your, your wife when you first married her and you look at her photo now, probably you're saying, did I marry the right, right woman? <laughs> oh, married the wrong person? <laughs> You don't look the same from the photo, you know. You know, in the, in, when we were in university in 1977, 78, well, today you look so different. You're not a girl I married. <laughs> All right. So, change, but you, you must be able to accept that. Right? Okay, so, it's, so he, the difference is he discerns it as it actually is. It doesn't mean that you cannot appreciate it. Like happiness, does it mean that you don't appreciate happiness? No. You appreciate happiness. If you, if, if the Buddha is saying that you should not appreciate happiness, the Buddha would have given so many teachings which tells you to find hap hap happiness. Isn't it? In fact, Achan Bran very cleverly, he says the third noble truth is not end of suffering but happiness. Right? He gave talks to, to you guys and he said that the, you look at the four noble truths, he, he, he put it in a positive way, the third noble truth is actually happiness. Because end of suffering is happiness. Because Nibbana, what is, the, what is Nibbana? Many people say Nibbana means extinction. But the Buddha also has a phrase which says Nibbanang Paramang Sukang. What does Nibbanang Paramang Sukang? Means Nibbana is the highest bliss. Nibbana is the highest happiness. So Acham Brahm is not wrong by, by, by saying that. It's just that traditionally we never put it as happiness. <laughs> you see, so there are many ways you, you, you can you can look look at this thing. Okay, so I'll just skip this. All right. So the conclusion is there is a difference. This is the distinction is the between the well instructed disciple, the noble one, the ordinary one. So the distinguishing factor is equanimity. All right. So the li what is equanimity? The liberating quality that allows us to keep our hearts open and balanced. Uh, that's the key word. Keep our hearts open and balanced, quiet and steady in the midst of changes. 
are we able to, to do that? All right. So that is, the, that is the key. How do we develop equanimity? That is why you remember the four Brahma Viharas? We start with loving kindness, we then we have compassion, then we have joy and then equanimity. All right? Before you can help someone, you want to do a good action, you want to do a good, good deed. First, you must have a thought, a good thought, isn't it? Metta. You put a good thought into action, compassion. So you help someone. What should happen next? Happiness. You should feel joy. Oh, you know, that's wonderful. You know, somebody has benefited. And then do you continue to remain happy, happy? <laughs> no, you just go back to your, to your natural state and then have equanimity. So that you can continue to render service, render your help, express your compassion to other people. And then you, then you start with metta again. And then you have compassion. Metta must always be followed by compassion, isn't it? Metta is um, wishing all beings be well and happy, loving kindness. Compassion is wishing that the causes of suffering in other beings are, are reduced. Right? Then when you do all these things, when you do this joint action, then you feel happiness, pity, right? or mudita. Isn't it? You feel happiness. Now, do you, do you keep on thinking, oh, I'm, see, I've done such a great thing? You know, you don't keep, do you keep on clinging to that? To that mudita that you do, you, you don't, you let go. And then you have equanimity. Because once you have an equanimous mind, then you can cultivate your loving kindness again. So the four Brahma Viharas actually goes in that, in that way. Okay? So I took a, 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 a paragraph from Upandita. You know, many of you know Upandita? Some of you attended some of his, his meditation class. He is one of those uh, great masters who have passed away a couple of years back. Uh, I think many of you learn meditation, including my, myself. The only meditation I know actually may know is from Mahasi Sayadaw's uh, tradition. Right? So Mahasi Sayadaw's tradition, you've got U Pandita and U Janaka, right? two, two great masters. I think U Janaka is still alive, right? U Janaka. But U Pandita passed away. Equanimity is not indifferent. In this book of his, it's called In This Very Life. One might worry that reflections are non-attachment. Remember I told you, if you, if you, are, you have to be non, non-attached, right? So people, one might worry that reflections on non-attachment and equanimity could turn into unfeeling indifference and lead us to abandon a mate or a dear person. You say like that, no? you know, you go back and tell your wife or your husband, sorry, you know, I, I must be equanimous. <laughs> you be equanimous, you know. You, you do that, then next time they will come. No, no, nobody will come to BGF. <laughs> All right? This is not the case. Equanimity is not insensitivity, indifference, or apathy. The mind rests in an attitude of balance. The key word is balance. An acceptance of things as they are. You accept them as they are. In, in other words, when happiness ar- arises, you, you know how to make use of have happiness. You appreciate have happiness. But you are not obsessed with happiness. You, you know that if there's happiness, hmm, lurking behind could be unhappiness. If it doesn't arise, that's great. We, but it also doesn't mean you go around looking for unhappiness. Hey, how can unhappiness does arise? <laughs> you don't do that. All right? But if it does arise, okay, you say, well, that's part and parcel. Isn't it? Okay? <laughs> so, so I think this is a very, very wonderful teaching, right? Uh, this is Master Ching Yen, right? Uh, Ching Yen, right? Ching Ching Yen from uh, Fakusan. Fakusan, right? I've met with world leaders, this is what he says, mild equanimity. He said, I've met with world leaders and given a keynote address in the UN General Assembly. How how many monks have the opportunity to speak at the United Nations General Assembly? Other than him, I think Bhikkhu Bodhi also spoke during Vesak. So he is one of them. My disciples include high levels officials in Taiwan. I was received as a VIP in motorcades in China and Thailand. I'm venerated by my followers. People feel that if they don't treat me this way, it's not right. But it does not make any difference to me whether they treat me this way or not. All right? This is what Master said. He said, I'm famous today, but tomorrow, when I can no longer do what I do now, I will be forgotten. All right? How many people have their names remembered in history? All right? You, you look, at, look at companies, you, you, you pick up, you know this magazine called Fortune 500? <clears throat> you pick up a copy of Fortune 500 in 1970. You look at all the companies, Fortune 500, and you pick up the Fortune magazine today, where are all those companies? They're all gone. <laughs> They're all gone. You see? So, 
He says, when I'm no, I will be forgotten. How many people have their names remembered in history? How many companies people still, still, still remember? Right? Fame, like wealth and power, is illusionary. So a mind of equanimity is necessary in all circumstances. So this is a book that uh, <clears throat> is actually his autobiography. It's interesting, be before he, I think, well, he obviously knew that he was going to pass away. So this book was completed a couple of months before he passed away. So it's a wonderful book and it talks about his life story, how he started off as a, as, as a monk, <clears throat> as a monk in, um, he's, from, he's from, from China, obviously, like most monks, he went to Taiwan, then he went to America. Because he found that, that that's where, you know, he, the pe people really needed the, the Dharma. So when he first went to America, nobody knew him as a Zen master, Chinese Zen master. And, and, and where does he stay? He actually stay, you know, along the, the alleys, you know, the five foot ways in, 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 in New York, like a homeless. Right. Then slowly, some, because of affinity, you know, some Americans came to see him and say, hey, are you a monk? You know? Maybe we, we could learn something from you. And slowly, you know, then a small group of followers grew. And, and today, <laughs> he has got universities in America, he has got universities in Taiwan, he has got Dhamma drum centers all, all over the world, including Malaysia. And they have got nuns, I think, well, the present nun has just gone to Taiwan. So they got, they got... They, 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 no, 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 no. There's Marshal Shonhua. Yeah. So this is called Dhamma Drum. Dhamma Drum. Faku San. So, so, so this is Master Sheng Yen, type 2009. Okay. So these are great masters. Right? <coughs> you can get hold of this book. It's an autobiography. Very, uh, very well written, you know, and uh, very easy to understand. Right? It's an autobiography of a Chinese Buddhist monk. <laughs> Chinese Buddhist monk. But he's a, what you call a Zen monk. You know, Zen Buddhism? So Zen is basically Japanese, but actually Zen came from China. So China called Chan. Chan, right? Praise and blame. When praise, are we aware of our reactions? Do we crave for more? I think that's, that, that's what this question is. If people praise you, okay, great, fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. But don't say, hey, is that all? Uh? Go, go. Some, some of all. <laughs> Oh, only this? I thought, I thought I did more than this. <laughs> when people blame you, do we justify our actions, accept the blame, or we blame the person who blame us? Then you become like the dubacha. <laughs> Remember the one that we saw in the Vimana, uh, not Vimana, the, what's the name, the Sutta? Yeah. All right. so, when, so when blame, do we justify our actions, accept the blame, or we blame the person who blame us? <laughs> so sometimes, so these are things we, we, we reflect, right? When we feel badly when blamed, can we be mindful of feeling badly rather than get lost in it? Right? Can, we let, can we let it go since praise and blame are often out of our control? So I've just put this question is for us to go back and, and think about it. Right? We have no answers today. Right? I'm, I'm not asking you to raise your hand and, and give an answer. No, no. It's something for us to, 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 to reflect. Okay? Now, there's a story of Atula. This is in the Dhammapada. This Atula is an old saying. They blame those who are silent. They blame those who speak too much. Those speaking little too, they blame. No one avoids blame in this world. There never was, there never will be, nor does there exist now anyone who is wholly blamed or wholly praised. Isn't it true? During the Buddha's time, uh, <coughs> Sariputta is, is supposed to be the, the very analytical monk, so each time people ask him to give a teaching, he will talk. But again, you know, just like now, you know, he may give wonderful teaching, but People, not everybody will understand. Some will then, at the end of the talk, say, oh yeah, this monk talked too much. I don't know what he's talking about. Oh, so difficult. So they said, okay, let's go to another monk. So they went to Maha, Maha Kasapa. Maha Kasapa is supposed to be the great meditator. So, so when, when they say, Maha Kasapa, can, can you talk, can you teach me what's the Dhamma? This Sariputta, he's teaching. I don't know what he's talking about. Too abstract. Huh? Too many thought moments in one thought process. <laughs> Those kind of stuff. Then uh, Maha Kasapa said, oh, very easy. Sit, close your eyes, meditate. <laughs> <laughs> so they sat. They sat for, for a few minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. He said, what? Is that all? Yeah. yeah. Then he said, the one who talks a lot, you blame. Now I don't talk anything, you also blame. So, so what do you want? <laughs> gain and loss. Is gain always positive? Is gain always negative? Sometimes you, you, you look about it. 
Sometimes you, you, you gain some, something, is it always positive? Yes. But sometimes you lose something, is it also always negative, not necessary? Sometimes we see it in, in our lives, isn't it? We wanted, for example, we wanted this job very, very much. We almost got that job, but uh, we couldn't get, get that job. Somebody else got that job. So it's a loss, right? Then three months later, you found actually that, that, that company go bankrupt already. <laughs> and that actually happens to me many years ago. Many years ago, I was, I was uh, offered a, a job as a, as a VP in one of the, uh, the company in, 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 in Penang. So, so I was very excited and offered. But before they could offer to, to, to me, there was a change of management. It was an acquisition. So they said, sorry, you didn't get a job. So I said, okay, but then I got an, another job. So, so I, I went on. And two months later, I read in the news that the, that the, the VP of, of the, 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 the vice president of, the, of operations, he was, um, he was, because the company went bankrupt and then they didn't pay salaries, and the VP operation was uh, arrested by, by the police <laughs> because he didn't pay. So if I had gone in that job, I, I would probably be the one in the front page news in the star. <laughs> So a loss is also quite ne not necessarily negative. So we look at it in terms of long term, right? Sometimes you lose certain things, but it, a lot, it leads to other opportunities, isn't it? Right? So you, you ne ne never look at loss as something ne negative. I think in Chinese there's a phrase that says, in, what, in adversity there is opportunity. Right? In adversity there is opportunity. Okay? So was, wasn't it true that what we thought at the time was a gain was actually a loss and vice versa. In, in attaching to gain, is there also the fear of loss? In terms of success, is there also the fear of failure? You know, like for instance, success. You know, if, <laughs> even in a, in a mundane world, you know, if you, are, you keep on rising in a corporate ladder, if you're the CEO, all right, the higher you go, the harder the fall, isn't it? Right, not? Higher you go, the harder the fall, all right? So it's, that's life, right? So there's no need to attach to it, right? We cling to models of success. We set ourselves up for disappointment. Gain and loss are a natural part of a flux of life. Okay, so I got this quote from Master Singin. Right? This is from his, his collection of uh, very wise words. I call it very wise words. Aphorism. aphorism right? Humble table, wise fair. I think it's a literal Chinese translation. <laughs> he says, life with suffering and happiness is full. Life with success and failure is reasonable. <laughs> Life with gain and loss is fair. Life with birth and death is natural. So it's something for us to, to think, think about. All right? If there's, you have suffering, you have happiness, you have lived a full life. You have a complete life. That means you see what is suffering, you see what is happiness. Why is it necessary to have both? Then you understand the need to help others, the need to be compassionate to, to others. When you have suffered, then you know huh, how other people suffer. Then that heart of compassion will arise. So in a way, you can look at it in a positive way. All right? Okay? So, so that's why he says, the uh, master says that life is suffering and happiness is full. He did not say life with suffering is full. Is it? <laughs> but life is suffering and happiness. Remember? Of course, we want to have more happiness. Isn't it? We want to have more happiness than suffering. But sometimes life is not, it's not always what we want. It's not always what we want, unfortunately. Okay? Life with success and failure is reasonable. Success and, and failure. <laughs> you know, my, 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 my company, we used to pride ourselves that we actually have 13 years of consecutive growth, which we actually, which we actually do. You know? But I told my chairman, I said, you know, you know but you, know, you never know, like stock market, you go up, you can always come down, we don't know when. But okay, as long as we are still growing, you know, we continue to grow. All right? We continue to grow. So, but it's always at the back of mind, we should know when that will happen. So life with birth and death is natural. When you're born, you, you die. It's, it's natural, isn't it? So it's unnatural. So I think these are, these are great sayings, short sayings, that we call it pity sayings. You know, pity, not, 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 not pity, not, not the... Kasiander, the pity, not the pity, the P I T H Y, pity. P I T H Y. You know the meaning? P I T H Y. That means short, inspirational saying. So this is our one. Just, just remember this, right? So, 
So these are just something for us to think about. Can we be aware of suffering inherent in the pursuit of pleasure and avoidance of pain? Can we experience pleasure with no clinging to it? Can we feel pain without trying to get rid of it? Understanding the changing nature of pleasure and pain that is beyond our control, can we not cling to them? Because sometimes this pleasure and pain is quite beyond our control. We have really no control. Like when we get old, we definitely fall sick, isn't it? Right? We definitely fall sick. And you know when people fall, fall, fall sick, they always like to ask, why me? <laughs> right? <Not. laughs> that question, why not? <laughs> can be any one of us. Right? Why me? Right? So understanding the nat changing nature of pleasure and pain, we, we, cannot, we, cannot. we should be open to pleasure and pain, yet not overwhelmed by desire or aversion. Yeah, we can be open to it. We should, ex we should welcome pain. <clears throat> in, in fact, like wealth, you know, we should welcome wealth, but don't be a slave to wealth. In fact, there's a, uh, there's a talk, uh, not a talk, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a discourse called, called Adiya Sutta, where the Buddha talks about the blessings of wealth. Wealth, you know. So contrary to what people think, oh, you know, if you're a Buddhist, you're a spiritual person, you're not supposed to have money, you know, supposed to be like a beggar. <laughs> but in the, in the Adiya Sutta, Atanyata Susutta, the Buddha talks about the, the blessings of wealth. You know, the blessings of wealth. In other words, if you have wealth, it's a blessing. And he explains what you should do with the wealth. But the wealth must be, he said, must be righteously earned. Uh, okay. If it's a real donation, it's a real donation. You cannot simply bluff and say it's a do donation, but it's not a do donation. Or it must be righteously earned. Okay? Okay, there's a, there's a Zen story here. You see, a student went to his master and said, My meditation is horrible. I feel distracted. My legs, leg, my legs ache. I'm constantly falling asleep. It's just horrible. What did the teacher say? Don't worry, you will pass. And then a week later, the student came back to his master. My meditation is wonderful. I feel so aware, so peaceful, so alive. It's wonderful. What did the teacher say? It will also pass. <laughs> Isn't it? So we should not cling to, cling to, to, cling to, to that. Right? Again, all these are very wise sayings. Isn't it? So he, he tells us. Okay, so do we need to be seen by others when we do something we think worthy? Do we need to tell people? Do we need to publish in the... You know, put it in Instagram, in Facebook, <laughs> that, that we're going to do something good. You know? What is our reaction to being misjudged? What is our relationship to status? Do we really you know, always look for status? Or do we just do something because we know it's, it's good? All right? So being aware of relationship to fame and disrepute allows to be free from... from from dependency on opinions of others. So if we think that we are doing something good, all right, you, you spoke to your, maybe your, your, your teacher, your master, you know that you are doing something good. Don't, don't be worried if people ridicule you or people think that, oh, you know, why are you doing this? You know? So you know that you are doing out of good intention, good motivation. I think that's, that's really key. Yeah? So question to, to, to reflect as a conclusion, do I often give others happiness or unpleasant experiences? Do I help others? who are unhappy. How often do I blame people instead of praising them? What can I do with fame? What will it really bring me? And how will it be useful? What will be useful when I'm about to die? <laughs> all right. So I think at the end of the day, you know, we all have to go to happy hunting ground. Right? <laughs> As the Red Indians say, you know, the, the, the Red Indians in America, they have a phrase that eventually all of us, we go to happy hunting ground. <laughs> I mean, we'll die. <laughs> Right. So, we end, I end with a short advice from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. He says, spiritual practice is difficult in the beginning. So from what I've just mentioned, it's, okay, it's very difficult. You know, it's like tough. Why am I wasting my, my time today? Oh, I should have done something better. Yeah, I'm not going to do this. I can't do all these things. So His Holiness says that spiritual practice is difficult in the beginning. You wonder how on earth you can ever do it. <laughs> how can I breathe? Reflect now, reflect in the past, reflect in the future. I've got better things to do. <laughs> reflect all these things. He says, you wonder how on earth you can ever do it. But as you get used to it, as you practice it, the practice gradually becomes easier. Do not be too stubborn. And don't push yourself too hard. Uh, don't say, you know, after, after attending one meditation retreat, after listening to three suttas in one day, my next stage is to attain fourth jhanas in one week. 
It's not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. You're going to end up in a fourth level depression after that. <laughs> and then in the end, who, who benefits? The psychiatrist. <laughs> Do not be too stubborn or push yourself too hard. Yeah. You know? I remember Achan Brahm's uh, meditation when, when, when someone asked, asked him, you know, sloth and topper. You know, I, I cannot practice social support. What, 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 what should I do? Should I walk backwards? <laughs> should, should, should I run? I think his answer was the best. Go and sleep. <laughs> go and sleep. You are too tired, you go and sleep. And once you, are, you, you, you feel that you are, you know, you don't feel so tired, you know, mentally you are alert, then you come back and then your meditation will be better. Okay. So do not be too stubborn or push yourself too hard. Remember the story of Ananda, the, 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 the venerable An An Ananda? The, the story says that uh, when the Buddha passed away, Ananda was not yet a fully enlightened monk. Uh, an, uh, enlightened monk. So he was like a first stage, a Sotapan, right? Then there was a, a, a council, wasn't it? Uh, I don't know how. Supposed to be what? Nine? Yeah, three months after that. There was to be a, for me, my, my hung, there was supposed to be 1,500 500 monks, is it? 500 monks. So there are so far only 499. Very, very, very dramatic one. So one seat to fill up by Ananda. So Ananda was thinking, hey, I'm going to fill up that seat. It's 500 monks. Now only 499. That seat is for, for me, and I'm not yet an enlightened. No enlightened cannot go there. So they try very hard. Practice, practice, practice cannot. Finally, they say, oh, yeah, give up. Lah. Cannot, I cannot attend. So they decide what to do. Going to sleep, right? Going to retire. So as he was lying down, as he was resting, oh, he came like that. <laughs> and, and and of course, the stories must always be, be, be dramatic, right? So immediately from there, he he flew all all, all the way there. <laughs> all right. So it's like, it's like uh, you know, Hollywood uh, production. But that story tells you that if you, uh, you know, the five hindrances, five hindrances, sloth and topper. Restlessness and worry. If you are restless and worried, how can you practice? You, you, you can't. You are too tired, sloth and topper. You know sloth? Like the sloth. You know, very slow. So you, you cannot. So you are restless, you are worried, you cannot. So make sure you are calm. So as you gain inner strength, your positive actions will gain in profundity and scope. Right. So I think this message is very important. It kind of uh, tells us that, you know, you don't, you don't have to worry that, you know, well, I'm just, so junior, how am I going to attain all those lofty ideals? You know, we're talking about fifth jhanas, four jhanas. You know, impossible. You know? But nothing is impossible. So the conclusion for for this is 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 that uh, I think that's the last slide. Oh yeah, that's the story of Sutung Po. The last. You know the story of Sutung Po. You know who is Sutung Po? He lived in the 12th century. He was a Chinese poet. Government seven or so, right? And those of you who like to eat tumporo, you know, <laughs> right? The famous uh, Hangzhou Hangzhou cuisine, right? Uh, so tung, tumporo is actually named after him. Uh, so when each time you read, you, you eat tumporo. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sorry if you're vegetarian. <laughs> you, eat, you eat tumporo, remember su tumpo. Have you heard of this story? How many of you have have you have, have heard? No. You have heard. No? You have heard. So many of you haven't heard. Oh. So you're, you're not Chinese, huh? Oh, okay. Terrible. Mm -hmm. Jing was such a strong exponent of China. I think you guys... Uh... Okay. Su Tung Po, okay. It's a, it's a very interesting story. Su Tung Po is a famous Chinese poet. He wrote a poem ending in these two lines. The eight winds cannot move me, sitting on my purple golden lotus seat. You know the eight winds? The eight... eight huh? So he was, Su was very pleased with himself and decided to send his servant on his horse to take the scroll with the poem over the Yangtze River to his good friend, a Zen master for his comments. So Su Tung Po, as you know, is a poet. So he wrote this on Chinese uh, the calligraphy. He said that eight winds cannot move him. He sits on a gold, purpose golden lotus seat. All right? So he said he was very pleased. So he said, you want to write this calligraphy? He has got a friend who is a Zen monk, Chan master. So he asked his uh, servant, you know, please take this calligraphy and give it to this Zen master. This is my, 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 you know, my excellent work, my calligraphy. So 
So after many, so of course the servant went. So after many days, the servant returned. Su was very excited. Sent for the servant and ah, what did my friend the Zen master say in my poem? He said it's an excellent piece of calligraphy that I wrote. He said wonderful. The servant said, the servant maybe he, he was a bit reluctant to say. <laughs> he said with due respect, sir. He said nothing else except fat fat. P ah p p fat p. P ah p you know that means fat. Which in Chinese means what a load of decaying smellish hogwash. I mean what a rubbish you, you know it's like you know people shit no that you're ex excreted so, so what is that? Oops. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so so what what happened is when Su Tung Po got this message from from the his servant, Su Tung Po was furious. He said, This is my good friend. I wrote him my best poem. You know, and is that all he said? Shit. Food. What? <laughs> he said, How could it be? So he said, he cannot tahan really. So he so he said, then he take the horse. The story is he takes the horse right all the way to meet the Zen master. He said, Zen master, said, master, you are my friend. Why did you say such things? You know, don't you have praise for me? What did the Zen master say? He said, all that I said was, was, was shit. And yet, you know, you, you come all the, the, the way, how many winds bring, bring you here? So you said, eight winds cannot move you. But just a fart is a very small wind. <laughs> It's a fart, it's a small wind, you know, the fart cannot, cannot move anybody. Right? And yet you, you took the trouble of the horse fly all, drive, ride all the way to come and see me. So do you still? Ah, see, that's the story. Is that. So he was so angry, he rode the horse across the, across the, the river, covered more miles and then rushed inside the Zen monastery and confronted a friend. He said, what do you mean demeaning my creative writing? I thought you say you cannot be moved by that it only wins. How come two small farts can blow you such a long way? You see? <laughs> so this is the story of Su, Su Tung Po. Okay? So that, 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 that is the last slide. Okay? But, the, but, the, but the key is that the equanimity, how to develop equanimity. Actually, there's another dis discourse which, which the Buddha says we should reflect every day. Uh, actually, that discourse, I think I have spoken at BGF uh, many months ago. It's called Five Things We Reflect Every Day. Remember the Upajatana Sutta? Upajatana Sutta. What are the five things we reflect every day? The first thing is we are subject to old age. We have not gone beyond old age. Right? The second thing we are subject to illness. We have not gone beyond illness. What is the third thing? Yeah. We are subject to death. We will not be able to escape death. Right? Right? In, in, in America, there's a saying, two things you cannot escape. Death and tax. <laughs> tax. <laughs> Insurance people know that. <laughs> death and taxes, you cannot escape. And what is the fourth thing? No, the fourth thing is to be separated from people that, that you like and to be associated with people that you don't like. You cannot escape from. It's a natural thing. Right? You, you go to work, can you choose that the, you, can you make sure that the boss is someone that you will like? You cannot, the, the one who, your, the colleague who sit next to you, you also cannot be, be sure that he will be someone that, that you like. And the one is the fifth thing? Karma. Karma. All right. So you reflect on karma, that we are heirs of our own karma. We inherit our own karma. We inherit our own actions. Whatever you do, you can't run away from, from, from it. Even nobody knows about it, but you yourself know. So that's your karma. So these are the five things the Buddha said we, we, we reflect. So if you reflect on these five things every day, all right, uh, then when the eight winds blow, you will not, like, you will not be like Sutung Po. <laughs> you will not be like Sutung Po. Okay? Then you are able to kind of balance up. You know? So you say, well, if I have happiness, great. Uh, Lama Yeshi, you know, one of the, the great Tibetan masters whom I, 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 I respect a lot. And he used to say, you know, he gives the, the analogy, you know, you know, it doesn't mean that you practice Buddhism, you cannot have the good things in life. If you like to eat ice cream, for example, yeah, go and get ice cream. Go to your famous, uh, your favorite uh, Baskin Robbins or, or uh, I don't know, well, what is the other, Hagen Dazs, you know, or Tom and Jerry, you know, <laughs> whatever brand. 
But if on that day itself, it doesn't have your particular flavor, don't make a hell of it. Don't, don't, don't throw tantrums. You know, don't come back, go and kick the neighbor's cat. You know, no. <laughs> no, don't, don't do, all, don't do all, all those things. Just say, okay, today I don't have my favorite color. Or my favorite flavor. You know? So in other words, you can appreciate what, what you have. But you don't have for that day, that's fine. I'll wait for another day. All right? Isn't it? Uh, like I was, you know, each time when I go overseas, one week, two weeks, I come back, you know, still got attachment, right? Attachment to, to local food. So I'll say, oh, I'll go to my favorite stall. So on that day, I go, hope the guy is close. <laughs> so, you know, I can, get, I can get angry, get upset, but would it change anything? It doesn't change anything. He's not going to be there anyway. By getting angry, he's not going, not going to come. Right? So then one can, 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 can ad- adopt that, that kind of approach. Then I think it makes life much, much more simpler. All right. Okay. So I think uh, that's what's the time now. Uh, okay. Four o'clock. Now it's three thirty. Good. So we have uh, we have time. Uh, you have a break, right? Is that is now the time for break? Okay. Maybe in another five ten minutes. In case there are some questions, so we have some we have some time. Do you have a- any comments or any questions? <coughs> five what, ten minutes. So these are not difficult suttas, right? They, they are not like, you know, there are some very difficult suttas, like Samaditi Sutta. <laughs> These are very, very difficult suttas, or Brahma Jala suttas, you know, or Vimamsaka suttas, you know. So, so these are pretty straightforward, but it, it requires a lot of, uh, of uh, self practice, isn't it? For us to practice. Any, any comments, any, anything you want to add on, or any clarification? It's okay? Alright, okay, then maybe we have a break and then uh, Bobby told, told me he also got, got wonderful tea for you from where? <laughs> from, from Nyonya, is it Nyonya Colors, you know, so uh, you, you might as well <laughs> enjoy it. And then maybe we'll come back at uh, 3.45, is that alright? Or 3, 3.40, 3.45, okay.